Bible says, Therefore, leaving principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, and of the doctrine, the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. This will we do if God permit. The doctrine of baptism. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. With the Lord's help, we're going to continue talking about. Uh, and I pray that God will give us all insight into His Word. Amen. Praise God. Could we just put our Bibles down right now and all of us together lift our voices to the Lord. Let's ask Him to speak to our hearts tonight. Everybody, let's talk to the Lord together right now. Jesus, I love you. I thank you, God, for your goodness. God, I thank you, Lord, for the privilege I have, Lord, of breaking the bread of life. Lord, for your flock. These are indeed the sheep of your pasture, God. Lord God, I want to serve you as a faithful under shepherd tonight. God, I will always be the flock of God, over which the Holy Spirit has made you the seal. Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to enlighten our minds and give us understanding, God. I pray, O oh Lord God, Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. Don't know. Uh, how long we will spend on this subject. I've said before I'm not in any real hurry. Uh, I started with about 20 pages of notes, and we got through about four of those in the first lesson. And uh, so based on that rate of coverage, it may take us uh, about five weeks total to get this covered. But however long it takes, I want us to have a thorough understanding by the time that I get finished. You will bear with me while I do a few moments of review. I'm not wanting to spend a lot of time there because we have so far to go. But uh, because it has been so long, I think it is important that we do this review. I will say again, if any of you were not here when we taught that lesson, please stop by the sound booth. When I get to teaching a series like this, you miss a lesson. We don't charge you for that CD. You can just stop by and tell them uh, that you need a lesson. And they will make that copy for you free of charge because we want everybody to hear the things that were said so we can all be on the same page. Uh, when I do a review, I don't have the time to go back and prove scripturally the statements that I make during that review. Amen. Praise God. <clears throat> we opened our lesson dealing with a question that was asked by Pilate. Uh, when Jesus stood before him, he asked very simply, what is truth? And Jesus gave the answer to that question, not to Pilate, but he had given it the night before in talking to his disciples. John chapter 17 and verse 17 gives the answer to that question. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now, you know, this is something that I stress a lot when we are teaching, but this is a verse of Scripture that is absolutely essential that we know and understand. Amen. Because there are a lot of different opinions out there, a lot of different teachings out there, a lot of different ideas and concepts out there. And we need to know that the only source of absolute truth is the Word of God. Right. Amen. Yes, sir. Help me out tonight, church. Amen. It doesn't matter if 99.9% .9 of Christian churches teach something contrary to the Scripture. The Scripture is true. Right. Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul said, let God be true and every man a liar. So it doesn't matter if a hundred percent of Christian churches teach it different from the Word of God. The Word of God is right and everybody else is wrong. Right. Hallelujah. Amen. It is imperative that we understand that. Our opinions are absolutely meaningless if they're not based upon the Scripture. We're not going to be judged by what we think. We're not going to be judged by what we believe. We are going to be judged by the never-changing Word of God. Right, right, right. Amen, amen. All of this I proved to you from Scripture. I don't, again, don't have time to, to give all these Scriptures, but, 
but they're there. In the first lesson, we dealt with them. The Apostle Paul emphatically stated there's only one gospel. In fact, he said, if anybody preaches anything different than what he uh, and the other apostles preach, they are cursed of God. Amen. Amen. We've got to find out what the apostles preached. Right. We've got to do things the way they did them. Right. We cannot allow our traditions to stand in the way of the truth. Tradition may be comfortable, tradition may be convenient, tradition may be familiar, but the truth will make us free. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, there are many who in their tradition, in their doctrines, in their uh, church teachings will tell you that baptism is simply an outward sign of an inward grace. Amen. And so we set out in our first lesson to deal with the question of whether or not baptism is really even necessary. Is it something we just do uh, because it would be good if we did? Or is it something we do because the Bible tells us we have to do it? Amen. And the key is what does the Bible say? And that's what we did. We began to look at the word of God to find our answers. We began by examining the commands of Jesus Christ Himself. Now really, that ought to end the discussion. When we see what Jesus said, why do we even need anybody else's opinion? Hallelujah. But the Bible does tell us that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And so we are not stopping with just the one witness. We're going to go on. But in the commands of Christ, we looked both Matthew 16 and 16 and John 3 and 5. Jesus very clearly commanded water baptism. In John 19, we dealt with this uh, in great detail in our first lesson. Uh, Jesus hanging on the cross. And uh, when he died, they pierced his side. And the Bible says, forthwith came there out blood and water. Amen. And uh, we took you then to 1 Corinthians 15, showed you that Jesus is the second Adam. There was significance to the fact that there was something coming from his side because the first Adam got his bride from his side. And what came from the side of the first Adam was a rib, and God took that rib and made it Adam's bride. What comes from the side of the second Adam is not a rib, but it's blood and water. Not blood only, but blood and and water. And God takes blood and water and makes the bride of Christ. Yes. Yes. Amen. And we sang it in our song tonight. Uh, but, but it's more than just the words of a song. First, uh, first John chapter five tells us that the water, spirit, and blood agree in one. Amen. The water, the spirit, the blood agree in in one. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. The blood of Jesus Christ is applied to our life when we are baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ. And salvation comes through that process coupled with receiving the Spirit of God. Amen. Called the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We'll deal with that more uh, a little later on. Amen. Now, we, uh, we also started in the last lesson dealing with the commands of the Apostle Peter. And it, it is important that we pay attention to what Peter said. Now, we do not believe, as the Roman Catholic Church teaches, that Peter was the first pope. Nor do we believe that Peter, uh, that, that the church was built on the rock, Simon Peter. We don't believe that. We believe the church is built on the rock of the revelation that was given to Simon Peter by the Spirit. Amen. We do believe, however, according to Matthew chapter 16, that Jesus gave to Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven and said, Peter, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That tells me it's pretty important what the apostle Peter has to say. Pretty important. I've, and, and we'll deal with this uh Somewhere in, in uh, one of the last lessons, we'll deal with it. But I have literally had people tell me that I would rather obey the, the words of Jesus than the words of Peter. As though the two of them contradicted one another. As though Jesus said something different than what Peter said, and we've got to make a choice which one of the two we want to agree with. I'm here to tell you, Peter never contradicted the Lord that we've got written record of. If he did, the Bible sure didn't tell us about it. Well, hallelujah. 
Amen. And so we're, it's not a matter of picking and choosing, but we understand that Peter was given the keys of the kingdom of heaven and, and what he bound on earth was bound in heaven. And so we went to uh, the first command of the apostle Peter was given to a hungry crowd. We know of 3,000 that day that accepted the message. I don't know how many rejected it. The Bible doesn't tell us how many people were gathered there on the day of Pentecost. It started with a crowd of 120, but it soon went way, way larger than that. There were 3,000 that accepted what Peter said. But you know, in, in any crowd, there are going to be those who don't accept. So I don't know, Brother Merriman, how many people were there. But there were thousands of people present, and they asked Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, if Peter said, accept the Lord as your personal Savior, then that's the end of our discussion. That's what we've got to do. But can I tell you tonight that, Jesus, that Peter never said, accept the Lord as your personal Savior. In fact, in fact, and I know, I know this contradicts a lot of current theology, but the phrase accepting Christ as your Savior does not even appear in the Bible. It's nowhere in the Word of God. There is nowhere that the Bible tells us to accept Christ. Hallelujah. I challenged a, a, a head of an organization one day. Uh, he was sitting in my office across my desk, and I challenged him. I asked him, tell me how to be saved. He said, accept the Lord as your Savior. I said, now show me where it says that in the Bible. He said, well, John 3.16. I said, that doesn't say accept Christ. Uh, it seemed like he may have given me Acts 16. I said, that doesn't say accept Christ. I want a scripture that says, accept the Lord as your personal Savior. He sat there for a long time and he finally said, uh, there's not one. I said, you're exactly right. There is no such scripture. And yet, isn't it amazing that thousands of people around the world today are telling folks to accept Christ as their Savior, that that is the plan of salvation and it's not even found in the Bible? Peter did not say, accept the Lord as your personal Savior. Here's what Peter said, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Then Peter said to them, Repent. He said, Repent. And be baptized every one of you. And in the be name baptized of every Christ, one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins. For the remission of sins. And you shall receive, the gift, of the, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This was Peter's answer as to how to be saved. Amen. Yes, sir. He didn't say, Except the Lord. He didn't say all you got to do is believe that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. He said, first of all, you've got to repent of your sins. Secondly, you must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of those sins. And then he said, you must receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, where we closed out last week was dealing with this little word for. Amen. He said, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins. A little word. We can just read over it very quickly, but we really shouldn't. There's a lot of significance in that word for. We, we talked about this in the original Greek. It is the Greek word ice. And if we transliterated that into English letters, it would be E-I-S. Uh, and, and, and that word ice... Uh, literally means in order to obtain. And that's what Peter said. He said, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ in order to obtain the remission of sins. So if you want your sins remitted, there's only one way for that to happen. You've got to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And then he said, you need to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now that's where we finished out our first lesson. We're going to pick up now, continuing on with the commands of Peter and uh, remembering that he holds the keys of the kingdom of, he uh, of, of uh, heaven. And uh, let's look now. He goes to the house of one Cornelius. Acts chapter 10, if you would turn in your Bibles there, that's where we're going to begin tonight's part of the lesson. Uh, in Acts chapter 10, Peter is sent to uh, a Gentile. And this is going to be the first Gentile convert in the New Testament church. And Peter is sent to him. He's given a vision and told to accept him and to go. And so Peter goes to the house of Cornelius, a devout man, a religious man, a praying man, a giving man, a man who's seen a vision of an angel. Amen. But uh, yet there was more for Cornelius to do. 
And so Peter arrives at his household and begins to preach. And we pick up with the story there in uh, Acts chapter 10, beginning with verse 44. Let's read. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Right. For they heard them speak with tongues. This is how they knew they'd received the Holy Ghost, for they heard them speak with tongues. And magnify God. Uh huh. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? Which have received, Which have the, received Holy the Holy Ghost as well as, as we. well as we. Now look at verse 48. And he commanded and them. And he. What, what is this word? Commanded. And, and he suggested. And he urged them. And he requested of them. That's not what it says, is it? You know, if baptism is not necessary, why would Peter command it to be? That's a strong word. That's a strong word. I mean, it's, it's not real often that we go around commanding folks to do anything. But Peter commanded them to do what? He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And so this was a direct command, amen, that they be baptized. Uh, now, I, I, I've mentioned to you before uh, a radio talk show that I was a part of a number of years ago. In fact, I was 17 years old, and I was the special guest on this radio talk show in the city of Dallas. Um, and uh, the subject was water baptism. And the host of that show, who was supposed to be a, a, a theologian and a Bible scholar, uh, told me, he said, if you cut uh, verse 48 off of this chapter, these people are saved. They have received the Holy Spirit. They have spoken in tongues. They are saved if you cut off verse 48. My question is, if they are saved, why command them to be baptized? Why not just simply say, all right, folks, now look, you know, you're already saved, but it'd be a good idea. But he didn't suggest it. He commanded it to be done. He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. I'm telling you that Peter believed baptism was essential for salvation. In fact, I'm going to show you where Peter says that plainly. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Which sometime were disobedient. When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, uh -huh. while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. All right, now hang on just a minute. I want you to notice what he says. He's re referring back, of course, to the story of Noah and the ark. And he says that at that time, there were eight souls who were what? Is that the word he used? They were saved how? By water. All right, now let's look at verse 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism baptism doth also doth now save us. Also now does he use that word? Sounds like to me Peter thought this was pretty important. Doesn't it sound that way to you? Yes, sir. He said baptism doth also now save us. Read. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It's not washing the, the outer man, it's not cleansing the flesh. But the answer of a good conscience but before God. But he said the only way you're going to have a clean conscience before God is to be baptized. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Amen. You, you, your conscience cannot be clean. You cannot have a good conscience before God any other way. Except through baptism. This is what Peter tells us. This is the teaching of of the man who held the keys of the kingdom. Just as Noah and his family were separated from the wicked world by water, it's going to be the waters of baptism that are going to separate the family of God today. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I, I don't know that I have received as much opposition on anything I've taught as when I get to telling people, you've got to be baptized. Hallelujah. Now, I do want to just make one thing very clear. And, and I know this is using big terms, but I want to make it clear in case you ever hear this. We do not believe in baptismal 
regeneration. There is a church out there that does, or more than one, that believes in baptismal regeneration. In other words, they believe that the instant you're baptized, that's all it takes and you're saved. I believe that it takes obedience to Acts 2.38. You've got to repent, you've got to be baptized, and you've got to receive the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. But Peter says the only way that our conscience can be clean, just like Noah had to go through the water, we've got to go through the water, and it's that water that separates us today. Now, the use of Noah and the ark is an interesting thing because the apostles all went back to the Old Testament to prove whatever they preached. You understand that? They were in the process of living the New Testament. They didn't have New Testament to get up and preach from. So every time they preached, they had to go back to the Old Testament. So I'm telling you, anything they believed, they had to have some Old Testament passage to prove it from. Does that make sense? All right, now, here's what I want to do. I want to take a few moments tonight and go back and look at the typology in the Old Testament. And I want us to see how beautifully this message of Acts 2.38, repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, receiving the Holy Ghost, fits throughout the typology of Scripture from Genesis all the way through Malachi. It is, it is in the Scripture over and over and over and over. This same typology is there. You're going to go with me for just a few moments here tonight. Amen. Praise God. Genesis chapter 1. The very first thing we read about in the opening of the Scripture, we find a world that was without form and void. And what happens next? Does anybody know? The Spirit moves upon what? The water. The Spirit moves on the water, and the result is a new and living world. you got a world that's dead, But then you've got water and spirit and you've got a new world that comes about as a result. Amen. We go to the book of Exodus. We find the children of Israel. They're in Egyptian bondage. Amen. The way that they began their escape started with a death. Amen. The death of the sacrificial lamb. Then what's the next thing? They were not still free completely from bondage. They left Egypt, but Pharaoh's hot on their trail. This is where a lot of folks are in their Christian experience. They may have repented of their sins, but, but Pharaoh and the world is still hot on their trail. Is anybody hearing me? And so what happens? They come to the Red Sea, the water. And when they pass through the water, Pharaoh and his army gets in the middle of the Red Sea. God pulls the chariot wheels off. God rolls the water back. All of the past is buried in the sea. And when they come out on the other side, Brother Merriman, they are free and they can begin a new life of freedom from bondage. They get into the wilderness. God says, I want you to build a tabernacle. Here's what we're going to do. This tabernacle is going to have a gate all the way around it. Fence all the way around. One gate and a, and a fence all the way around it. And, and when you walk through the one gate, the only way to get into the court of the tabernacle, there is a piece of furniture you're going to be confronted with first and foremost. And that was the brazen altar. The altar made of brass. It was a place of death. Something had to die On the altar. The next thing, as soon as they finished at the altar, they had to go to the brazen laver. Sometimes called the brass sea. It was the place of water. And God was very, very specific. In fact, we won't take the time to read this verse, but if you're taking notes tonight, write down Exodus 30 verse 20. Because this is a very important command that God gave. Amen. He said, wash with water that they die not. I know you've been to the altar. I know there's been a place of death. But there's got to be a place of washing if you want to continue to live. Now they passed the brazen labor. Then the priest could walk into the tabernacle proper where the Spirit of God dwelt. Death. 
water, spirit. This is what we see over and over and over again throughout the scripture. Amen. They, they, they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Uh, when it's time for them to enter into the land of promise, how do they have to get there? You know, there were other ways for them to get where they were going. But God said, if you're going in, we're going to go across the Jordan. You're going to go through the water. And so their wilderness, where, where, where uh, thousands of them died, hundreds of thousands of them died in the wilderness, they then pass through the water. When they get through the water, they are beginning a new life of freedom in a land of promise. Hallelujah. This is, I'm telling you, it's just repeated over and over and over and over again. Now, the beauty of all this is when we compare it to the gospel. What is the gospel? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, the Apostle Paul tells us what the gospel is. 1 Corinthians 15 and 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. All right, now, Paul says, I'm, I'm going to tell you again the gospel that I preached to you. Which also ye have received. Which you received. And wherein you stand. And wherein you stand. By which also by ye are saved. which you are saved. You're saved by the gospel. Right. All right. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, huh? unless ye have believed in vain. All right. For I delivered unto you first I of all that which you. I also all, received. Uh-huh. How that Christ died right. for our sins. Here we go. This is, he says, this is the gospel that I preached. First of all, Christ did what? Died for Everyone us. say it. Christ did what? Died. So the first thing was a death. All right. And that he was buried. And he was what? So next is a burial. All right. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And he rose again. Everyone say resurrection. resurrection. So herein is the gospel. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. Now I'm telling you when you take that. And Paul said that's what saves us. Not that we believe that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. But the way that we understand it is to go back to what Peter told us in Acts 2.38. 2, Acts first thing that Peter said to do was what? Yeah. Repent. What's the first part of the gospel? The death. There's got to be a death. That's what repentance is. Repentance is not just saying you're sorry for your sin. Repentance is dying to your sin. It's not enough to say you're sorry if you're going to keep doing it. Repentance is death to the sin. So you die to the sin. What's the next part of the gospel? The burial. And what was the next thing that Peter said? He said, repent and what? Be baptized, every one of you. And I'm telling you that baptism is a burial. Baptism is a burial. In fact, the scripture clearly says that. And uh, uh, we, we'll get into that in just uh, in, in the next part of the lesson uh, when we talk about how we need to be baptized. But, but suffice it to say tonight that baptism is a burial. It is enclosing the old man who has died. Amen. You, you then are baptized in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans chapter 6 verse 4, if you want to write it down, we'll come to it later. But Romans 6 and 4, we are buried with him by baptism. Amen. And, uh, and then the third thing that Peter said was that you need to receive the Holy Ghost. What's the third part of the gospel? The resurrection, a brand new life after the death and burial, a new life begins. Amen. That's what receiving the Holy Ghost is all about. It's a resurrection. The old man is dead. There's a new man that's living. Now, I hope that you see how this fits the typology. When we talk about repentance, that's the death, that's the altar. When we talk about baptism, that's the Red Sea, that's the Jordan River, that's the brazen laver, that's the burial. When we talk about the Holy Ghost, amen, this is the new and living world. This is freedom from Egyptian bondage. This is the land of promise. This is where the presence of God is. This is the resurrection of Jesus Christ working in our lives. I'm telling you, this type of, now, you know, you, you can't, you can't use accepting Christ as your Savior to fit into this typology. It just doesn't fit. But, repentance, baptism, 
and receiving the Holy Ghost does. Amen. And, and this is not all. This is not all. You know, it's interesting to me that when Abraham got ready to send his servant out to find a wife for Isaac, the servant went out there, and where did he find Rebekah? He found her at the water, didn't he? That, and in fact, that was the test. This is how I'm going to know who the real bride is because of what she's willing to do at the water. Well, praise God. Amen. We go to Gideon's army, Judges chapter 7, and, and, and there's a lot of things that go on there. God says you're fearful and go back and, and all of this. But when it gets down to the final test of who is going to fight and who isn't going to fight, what was the last test that God told Gideon to put to his men? Go to the water. Let's see how they respond at the water. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, I know my next point of typology can be extremely controversial. And a lot of folks will, will really argue with me about this point. But let me just tell you tonight. I want us to go back to Genesis chapter 17 and verse 14 uh, and, and find here how a person inherits the, the covenant of Abraham. Is everybody with me? This is how you can be assured that you can receive the blessings of Abraham. Amen. Genesis 17 and verse 14. And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. All right, now. There are people who tell us we are preaching New Testament circumcision. And can I tell you, with that point in and of itself, I agree 100%. Because I've got Scripture to prove that that's what's going on. The Bible says it very clearly. Now understand, understand that for the, the, the people of Israel, it, it didn't matter what their bloodline said. What mattered was whether or not the males were circumcised. And if they were not circumcised, they had no promise of receiving the, the, the inheritance of Abraham, their father. They had to have the token of the covenant. Now let's go to Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without you, hands. He's talking to the church. You are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. In putting off the in body, putting off the of, the body sins of the sins of the, of the flesh by the circumcision by the, of Christ. Right, and hang on, hang on. By the circumcision of Christ. Now I want you to notice what comes right after that. Those two dots right there, it's called a colon. You understand in, in the English language that when you see that, what, what that says to you is that I'm about to explain what I just said. Here's the definition of what I just said. Paul said that you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And what is the circumcision of Christ? The very next verse, verse 12. Buried with him. Buried in with him in. Does anybody see what the Bible said? The Bible said that the New Testament way that we become the heirs of Abraham is not through fleshly circumcision, but it is the circumcision of the heart that happens at the act of baptism. Hallelujah! 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 hallelujah. I, I'm telling you, we gotta be baptized if we're gonna be saved. We don't have a promise of, of inheriting the covenant of our Father if we don't have that act of spiritual circumcision. Amen. God said, He said, I don't care if you are a Jew, if you have not been circumcised, you've broken my covenant. Right. Baptism is a part of the New Testament covenant that we make with God Amen. You must be baptized in order to be saved. Now, let me, let me move on. Change gears a little bit here and talk about the proper mode of baptism. Does this even matter? Does it matter how we are baptized? Uh, because there are some churches that will baptize you, uh, through what is officially called aspersion or, uh, more commonly known as sprinkling. They just sprinkle you with, uh, with water and they say that is 
baptism. Whereas other churches will completely immerse you. Does it matter which way we do it? Well, what, what is the determining factor whether it matters or not? Not how many people believe it or who does or who doesn't, but the determining factor is what does the Bible say? Amen. So let's look at this, uh, the proper mode of baptism. First of all, I, I want to just do just a very brief word study for you. The word baptize is really a, uh, an anglicized Greek word. It is, it is a, some of you say I don't know any Greek. You really do. When you use the word baptism, you're using a Greek word. It's just been brought into the English language. It's what we call transliterated, where they took the Greek letters and turned them into English letters and just gave us the same word. The Greek word baptizo is, is the word baptize. Amen. Now, uh, some of you will remember some of you probably will not, but, but in our first lesson, we quoted from a man who was a professor at the University of Athens in the country of Greece, Dr. A.D. Kiriasco. Anybody remember me quoting Dr. Kiriasco? Uh, my point to quote him was, if anybody knows the Greek language, that man's got to know it. Don't give me some guy here in America that is uh, some quote-unquote Bible scholar or the head of some uh, biblical institute. I want to know... To the people who speak the language, what does the word mean? And Dr. Curiasco said, uh, and I quote, The verb baptizo in the Greek language never has the meaning of to pour or to sprinkle. But invariably, that of to dip. Baptizo means immersion, not sprinkling. In fact, he goes on to tell us that, that there is a separate Greek term altogether, ratizo, that means to sprinkle. And that word is never used when baptism is discussed in the New Testament. Right. There is no place that the Bible says that, that they were sprinkled or the word ratizo was used to talk about what happened. But in every case, it was baptizo, which means to dip, it means to completely immerse. Hallelujah. Baptism and immersion are synonyms. To say, to say baptism by sprinkling would be the same as saying immersion by sprinkling. I've immersed you by sprinkling you. Well, that sounds crazy. But people say, I baptized you by sprinkling you. And the words baptism and immersion mean the same thing. There is no way that a person has been truly baptized if they have only been sprinkled. Let's look again at the scripture. This is what I was referring to a while ago. Romans chapter 6 verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism. Therefore we are what? We are what? We are buried with him. How? Read. With baptism into death. By baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Colossians chapter 2 verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Again, buried with him in Baptism. It is obviously impossible to bury a person by sprinkling or pouring dirt over them. They are not buried until they are completely enclosed. And I'm telling you that the only way scripturally you can be baptized is to be completely enclosed in water. This is the way it was done for Jesus. Matthew chapter 3 verse 16. And Jesus when he was baptized went up straightway out of the water. He went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened up unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove now, now, and lighting this is, upon him. This is, this is an interesting thing. Several years ago, I was sent a little brochure in the mail about some movie they'd put together. You know, they're always making movies about the life of Christ. And this was many years ago. And this brochure was all about this movie they'd made about the life of Christ. And they said that they'd consulted, consulted all kinds of... of a, theologians and scholars and it was the most accurate uh, biblically accurate portrayal of the life of Christ ever filmed now in the brochure they had a picture of Jesus being baptized by John and John has a uh, cup and 
he's pouring water over Jesus' head. I said, they didn't do very good research. Why would they both go down into the water? Why would Jesus come up out of the water if he wasn't being immersed? I mean, you can do that at a well. You don't have to go down into the river in order to be sprinkled. He was being immersed. And I'm going to tell you something. Jesus wasn't baptized because he had to have his sins remitted. He was baptized as an example for us. And if his example was through immersion, I don't want to do it any other way. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. Here's another example. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down. Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch. Both into the water. Uh Both Philip and the eunuch. Hang on. And they, they, they did what? Again, I ask you, why should both of them get in the water if he's just going to pour a little bit over the man's head? They can do that on the banks. <laughs> There's no reason to get in the water if all you're going to do is sprinkle him. They went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Right. Verse 39. And when they were to come up, out of the water, the Spirit of and the Lord. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. I'm telling you that the references to going down into the water, coming up out of the water, definitely show us that the practice of baptism in the New Testament church was by immersion and never by sprinkling. Amen. Now, you know, it's amazing what some churches today teach. When you go back and read what their founders had to say. And I'm not, I'm not knocking other churches. I'm just, I'm just being honest with you. Uh, Martin Luther, who obviously was uh, the founder of the Lutheran church, who today sprinkles in baptism. Martin Luther said, and I quote, Those who are baptized should be deeply immersed. His own church doesn't practice that today, but that's what he said. John Wesley, who founded the Methodist church, who practices sprinkling. Again, I'm not knocking these people. I'm just saying these are, these are historical facts. You can go to the library and find the information I'm giving you right now. John Wesley, in his commentary on Romans 6 and 4, talking about buried with him by baptism, said, and I quote, he said, this alludes to the ancient practice of baptizing by immersion. John Wesley admitted the reason Paul said buried with him is because these folks were immersed. Right. Now, my commentary on John Wesley's commentary is it shouldn't be an ancient practice. Right. It ought to be the current practice. Sure. Well, hallelujah. Amen. Here are some other uh, early church leaders and And theologians, again, you can go to your library and find any of this information. I'm not reading to you from some apostolic writer. This is information that's out there for anybody if you'll just take the time to look for it. Adam Clark, who wrote the commentary on the Bible, said, They received baptism as an emblem of death in voluntarily going under the water. John Calvin, founder of the Presbyterians, who also sprinkled, said, The word baptize signifies to immerse. And it is certain that the rite of immersion was observed by the ancient church. So when did the practice of sprinkling begin? Well, we we go to a man by the name of Eusebius. Eusebius is called the father of church history. He wrote more on ancient church history than anybody else. And many folks look to him as, uh, as, as the one reliable source for ancient history outside of the scripture. And here's what Eusebius said, and I'm quoting. He said, the first instance on ecclesiastical record of pouring or sprinkling is that of novation in the year 251. This is 200 years after Christ, all right? Everybody's with me? 200 years after Christ, before anybody was ever sprinkled and they called it baptism. Uh, This is what Eusebius said. Novation fell into a grievous distemper, and it being supposed that he would die immediately, he received baptism, being sprinkled with water on the bed whereon he lay, if that can be termed baptism. 
folks. In other words, we got a, we've got a, a, a political leader here who's about to die and he's never been baptized and the early church believed you had to be baptized to be saved. And the man's about to die, so they came up with some way they could get him baptized before he died. And they made up a way for political benefit. Is that the way you want to be baptized? I don't want to do it that way. I want to do it the Bible way. Right. Amen. Now, again, you can, you can look all this up in the library. Go down to the library. Uh, I'm, I'm going to just quote to you from a few books here, and then we're going to close out this part because when we get into the next part, we're going to be there for a while. So uh, I'll close out with this. But here are a few references you can go to. These are not apostolic writers. These are just historical references, both secular and Christian. And you can look them up for yourself. Uh, a summary of Christian history says this. Sprinkling did not become the general mode until after the ninth century. So, the first time it happened was 200 years after Christ. But you're talking the ninth century. 800 years after Christ. Before it became a an accepted practice. Almost a thousand years from the founding of the church before people call it acceptable and we want to say today it's okay? By whose standards is it okay? Not by God's. Christianity through the century says immersion seems to have been widely practiced during the first century. Baptism was normally by immersion. The Liberty Bible Commentary says the use of baptized indicates the form of baptism as immersion, of dipping or dunking into the water. Now here's a good one. Funk and Wagnall's Standard Encyclopedia. This is not an apostolic reference. All right. They say it is indisputable that at a very early period the ordinary mode of baptism was by immersion. They said, you can't even argue that fact. There's no disputing that fact. It was always done by immersion. The American People's Encyclopedia says, in the matter of baptism, there is little doubt that the original practice was immersion. The original practice was immersion. The National Encyclopedia says, with the Jews, the bathing of the whole body in clear cold water was a recognizable means of restoration from a state of ceremonial uncleanness. According to rabbinical teachings, even before the temple, baptism was an absolutely necessary condition to be fulfilled by each proselyte to the Jewish faith. They had to be completely bathed in water, completely dipped in water. That was the practice of the Jews and who was the early church? They were Jews. This is the way they did it. Amen. All right. Uh, the standard American encyclopedia says, In the primitive church, the person baptized was dipped. The World Book Encyclopedia, Sister Regan, if you'll go ahead and come. The World Book Encyclopedia says, In early times, baptism was by complete immersion. And then finally, the expository dictionary of New Testament words tells us that the Greek word uh, baptisma or baptism consists of the process of immersion, submersion, and emergence. In other words, you don't just take them to the water, you get them under the water and bring them up out of the water. And, and they said that's what the word, the Greek word baptism really means. You've got to put them all the way under. Well, praise God. Amen. You know, I want to do things the Bible way, don't you? Right. This is not about just sitting out to try to prove everybody else is wrong and I'm right. That's not what it's about. What it is about is finding out what the Bible has to say. Learning how the Scripture tells us to do things. There's a reason why God gave us this book. Right. How many times have I said there's a reason why God gave us this book? And there's a reason why John 3.16 is not the only verse in here. God's expecting more out of us than that. And we've got to get down this book. Amen. We've got to search the scriptures, Jesus said. 
Amen. It is our obligation to rightly divide the word of truth. I want to do it the Bible way. I don't want some man's opinion. I don't want to know what some church theology is. I don't want to just pull it off of a track somewhere. I don't want to get it out of somebody's handbook somewhere. I don't want some organization to tell me how to do it. I want to go back to the word of God. Find out how the early church did it. Find out what the scripture has to say. I want to do it the Bible way. I don't want anything else other than the word of God. Aren't you glad you know the truth tonight? Hallelujah. Amen. The Lord willing, Lord willing, next week, next week we're going to start talking about why we baptize in Jesus' name. Amen. If I get started on that tonight, we'll be here a while. Amen. Why do we baptize in Jesus' name? Amen. And, uh, uh, you know that the question always comes up about Matthew twenty eight nineteen, and we're gonna it's gonna be one of the first scriptures we go to in our next lesson is Matthew twenty eight nineteen. Amen. There's a reason why it says what it says, and yet the apostles did something altogether different. Because really they didn't do anything different. It's only our understanding of what Matthew twenty eight nineteen says. What the apostles did was exactly what Jesus told them to do. They didn't disagree with him. And, and, and you know, if they did, Peter wasn't the only one that made the mistake. Every apostle did the same thing. And in fact, we'll even pull some of these secular sources again, some of these non-apostolic writers again, and we'll go back and see what they had to say about the early church and the way it was done. And I'm going to tell you that even history, we, we, we look to the Bible, the Bible proves this is the right way. We go to history, and history proves this is the way the early church did it. Amen. I'm glad. I'm glad tonight to be a part of something that's trying to follow the Word of God. Th this is our guidebook. This, this is the light, the lamp, the path. This is what we need to follow. Amen. The Word of God and the Word of God alone. Let's stand and lift our hands to the Lord tonight, everybody.